Daily Nation. This is what is fresh off the press today. Railo backs Ruto on key proposal for referendum. It says president will have to pick his team from elected leaders. Both leaders want cabinet secretaries to sit in parliament. But the Vish 21 of the Daily Nation today. Police probe 6 billion shillings karaoke tax dodge and... This story is tucked away on page two detectives investigating city billionaire caught up in a counterfeiting storm question. His staff at the Thika Liquor factory. And there's a sidebar story here. This was such a touching story. It's all about Providence. When he appeared before a magistrate in Nairobi yesterday, Murage was unaware that his wife had been discharged, the bill settled, and he was going to walk home a free man with a job to boot. A lawyer had been sent to represent him in court by Nairobi Governor Mike Sonko after he pleaded guilty to a charge of attempting to commit a felony. When asked if he will get himself on the wrong side of the law anytime soon, he said he is not a troublemaker. And of course, you know the story that was doing rounds in the media about a, father's, a father who actually went to the hospital and was trying to get away with the daughter. Uh, in a bag because it could not really afford the hospital bill which was amounting to 56,000 and this story continues on page three of the Delhi Nation today Boniface Muragi did not know how his desperate move to sneak his baby girl out of the Kenyatta National Hospital will change his life for the better and you can read this story on page three of the Delhi Nation but this epitomizes actually the current state of play of healthcare in, in our country is it affordable even as we're gagging for universal health care such stories are really telling on where we are at where the common one uh, wanjiku Mwanainchi, is really suffering as far as health care is concerned is it affordable that is what is a probing question rotich quizzed in a kickbacks probe that is a splash today on the front page of the standards cabinet secretary or the director of criminal investigations confirmed treasury cs recorded statement with his team with his team of an ongoing probe into two 65 billion shillings dam projects in north rift where it is suspected high profile officials took bribes this story continues on page four of the standard this morning and also manhood hit baby in bag in KNH set free you know the story this is tucked away on page 12 of the standard this morning also facing north dp in talks with regions leaders here we are it says deputy president william ruto meeting leaders at a stakeholders forum organized by the north and northeastern development initiative at his current official residence in nairobi yesterday the star is holding this splash for us this morning jka takeover mps link kenyatta family K board chairman Isaac Awondo is also group CEO of CBA Bank. And we know CBA Bank, of course, is also affiliated to the Kenyatta family. PIC, citing conflict of interest, has summoned the KAA board to respond to concerns. This story continues on page four and five of the star this morning. Also, we can see that particular picture of the Rift MPs meeting Ruto to discuss Uhuru Ruto Pact. And the story is tucked away on page four of the star this morning windfall for trench digger who sneaked his baby out of knh is a good a story there on uh, the same good tidings and page two and valentine's day attack brev kajado teacher binds hyena's nose to save his life you can follow that story on page three of the star this morning edgerton university to start research on locust farming all the gritty details are on page 30 is all about new diet and of course, the World Health Organization have said such insects uh, are appealing and uh, a good source of protein. Let's now see what the business daily is holding for us. But before I go there, we do have also the people uh, daily. Rotich grilled all the 63 billion shillings stole dams. Moments or moment of truth. Treasury CS, who is among colleagues on the spot over 366 billion shillings abandoned projects record statement in fiddling likened to goldenberg scam and this story continues on page seven of today's people uh, daily let's move on and we see what we have on the front page of the business daily carrier uncovers a number plate scams on carrier uncovers number plates scam at the port taxman says hundreds of cars released into market without registration the taxman has 
The taxman has uncovered yet another vehicle number plates racket at the Mombasa port in which hundreds of cars have been released without the mandatory National Transport and Safety Authority registration. This story continues on page four of the Business Daily. Also, rock bonds trader faces loss of assets and jail time is another story that you can follow. A rogue treasury bonds dealer who pocketed 83.4 million shillings from irregular trades now faces jail as well as seizure of personal assets by the Senate after the Capital Markets Authority found him guilty of engaging in market manipulation between 2016 and 2017. The CMA yesterday fined the former CBA Capital Executive David Tumaini Maena 166.9 million shillings bank doubled the benefit accrued from the regular trades. The capital markets are or lately, they've been very active in trying to make sure corporate governance is being enforced. And you can follow the story on page four of the Business Daily this morning. Also, a cyber story, 18 farms in list of Kenya's early oil beaters. Kenya's or, or Kenya has reached out to 18 global oil refin refinery farms in the ongoing search for buyers of the early to Kana crude oil exports targeted for the second quarter of the year. Petroleum Principal Secretary Andrew Kamau yesterday said his ministry has sent out information to refining companies outlining the expected volumes of crude oil in the country to assess their level of interest. There's a standalone picture here, Land Matters, and this is National Lands Commission Vice Chairperson Abigail Bagai addressing the media outside Parliament buildings yesterday after she and other commissioners appeared before the National Assembly Committee on Lands. The term of the commissioners expired yesterday. This story continues on page six of the Business Daily this morning. Let's see what we do have also on the front pages of the dailies across the region. And this, not really across the region, but uh, uh, beyond the country. Economy bigger than previously estimated. This is what we have on the front page of the Citizen in Tanzania. Data published by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that Tanzania's GDP was 3.8% bigger in 2015 than initially estimated. And this story is, is tucked away on page four of the Citizen this morning. Also, poachers slaughter 25 giraffe in two years since report. The story continues on page two of the Citizen. Shilling hit 42 month low against the dollar. This is Tanzanian shilling. You can follow this story on page two of the Citizen. Ivory Queen sentenced to 15 years in jail. Chinese national Yang Feng Glan. Elias Ivory Queen was yesterday sentenced to 15 years in jail for trafficking ivory. Yang, who is 66, was jailed along with Tanzanian co accused Salvius Matembo and Philemon Manasseh who were also found guilty by the Kisutu Resident Magistrates Court. You can follow this story on page two of The Citizen in Tanzania. Let's see what also we have on the front page of Monainchi. Manager Fariki Dunia, Akiutubia Wanahabari, that is the story. And also it continues on page four of Monainchi in Tanzania. And we can see here, this is Naibu Waziri Wamaji Juma Awesu Akiwa Amepiga goti kwa ajili ya kumsalimia mwanafunzi wa kidato cha kwanza cha shule ya sekondari Eguguno. All right. And uh, that is a story that also you can read inside the Monainchi. This morning, let's see what is happening in Uganda. Daily Monitor. I want to show you the, the reason Daily Monitor. This is what is in Uganda. NRM top organ in doses for 70 for 2021 polls. All right. He's not relenting. Still, he will be running for president. He will be running for, of course, that particular office, the presidency, sole candidature. The resolution by the party's central executive committee will now be taken to the national executive committee and the national delegates conference before an, a final call can be made. And this story continues on page six of the Daily Monitor in Uganda. Also, UPDF now has highest number of generals Army MP General Ivan Coretta congratulates, that is uh, Lieutenant General Mohozi Kainerugaba during the, the, the peeping ceremony at the Ministry of Defense headquarters in Buya, Kampala yesterday. And you have this story tucked away on page five of the Daily Monitor if you're waking up in Uganda. Parliament passes minimum wage bill that has gone through and what's driving child kidnaps matters that is a probing question. All the greedy details on page two of the 
Daily Monitor, if you're waking up in Uganda, in Rwanda, New Times is up next. Nurses, midwives accused of using forged licenses. This is happening in Rwanda. The medical advice one gets from some health centers and hospitals could be unreliable. After eating much, that some nurses and midwives used or used forged documents. And we can see Senator or Senators raising concern over uncoordinated land plan. This is uh, in Rwanda. Senator uh, President Bernard Makuza speaking during a session as uh, Senate Vice President in charge of administration and finance, that is Jean uh, Ag Kakuba. Looking on yesterday, senators expressed concern over their coordinated land allocations, which they said could cause losses to governments in the future. This story is on page four also of the New Times in Rwanda. I wanted to show you briefly what we have on the front page of the East African this week. Allow me just to retrieve it quickly for you so that you can see uh, what is happening this week as far as as far as. Uh, the East African region is concerned, and also we, we, can, we can actually pick up on that and discuss with our panelists much, much later uh, the affairs of the week. Just give me a moment to just rummage through what we have there so that now I can show you. Well, where are you? When well, sometimes I really want it, it, it eludes me. But I'll just get it in a moment and show you what we have this week. Is it, where is it? Okay, I'll pick up that much, much later in the course of the program. But uh, it's that exclusive interview of President Kagame as well with, uh, d uh, with the Nation Media's editor. This is uh, Sitoni. Right, it's wasting my time. I'll do it much, much later in the course of the program. But I want to show you the editorial cartoons nonetheless. This is what Gado has drawn for us in the standard today. At Al Shabaab headquarters, this is how now they're popping the champagne and celebrating. And of course, the ticklish issue is Kenya Somali border dispute escalating. So, what does it portend as far as security is concerned? And will this particular uh, long drawn, of course, uh, uh, tiff between Kenya and Somalia as far as the monetary border is concerned uh, affect also our security? And I was staying in Somalia as far as the KDF is concerned, who are there under the Amazon. All right. Also in Nigeria, this is what is happening. Remember, this election was postponed to next week. And we can see uh, Victor has done something for us. With this confusion, the winner will be declared the loser. And the loser will be declared the winner. And we shall put this also on the table of our panelists to discuss this that, of course, was uh, another pronouncement by Buhari as far as people who will be tampering with the elections there, uh, what sort of measures he has declared that should be done. People have come out also to strongly condemn that, especially the opposition, and that we shall be looking uh, also deeply with our panelists. And this is a story of uh, Bernard Morage and epitomizing what Kenya has actually uh, become as far as health is concerned uh, to the common one, ain't she? Kenya? Horse prison. This is how uh, Stano has actually come up with that coinage. Uh, they are suffering from unpaid bills, right? And this is uh, the grim reality in most of the hospitals. People cannot actually be released because of unpaid bills. And this is what has been captured by Stano, Ministry of Health, free quality healthcare. But the reality down on the ground is that people are really, really suffering as far as bills are concerned. And as we're getting forward, the big four, which is one of the pillars is healthcare. Uh, this also should be a pertinent issue of concern and debate that Murage has brought to the fore as far as that is concerned. And of course, that is the story that we want to tell you this morning because there are happy endings with that. 22-year-old Benson Murage risked his freedom to smuggle his one-month-old daughter from the hospital. He was simply unable to raise 56,000 shillings demanded from him as a hospital bill for his child's treatment. Murage says he did it for his family and had no other option. On Tuesday, senior resident magistrate Caroline Zibe handed Murage a three-month suspended sentence after he pleaded guilty to the charge attempting to defraud Kenyatta National Hospital. The sum of his daughter's medical bill, 
he will be on state watch and expected not to commit any other offence during the three-month-old or the three-month period, I should say. NTV's Zainab Ismail starts us off. Boniface Murage's daring act is the illustration of a father's love. He walked out of the Milimani Law Courts on Tuesday with one thing on his mind, to see his daughter, whom he tried to smuggle out of hospital to avoid paying a hospital bill he simply could not afford. In this one-roomed house on the outskirts of Rongai in Kajedo County, the family of three are happy to be united. The smile on Murage's face as he holds his one-month-old baby, Vivian Wangeshi. Evidence that his daring act was all for the love for his family. But on February 16th, Murage was intercepted by security guards at the hospital when he refused to allow them to inspect a bag he was carrying that apparently had his baby inside. The blue bag with images of teddy bears was however too suspicious to smuggle out of the hospital. Murage has however been freed on a three-month suspended sentence, which means he will be put on state watch and expected not to commit any other offence. In the event he does, he will be put on custodial sentence. On Monday, Nairobi Governor Mike Sonko cleared the bill. The county press office also said the governor has offered Murage a job. For now, Agnes and Boniface are hopeful for a better future with a little bundle of joy as they decide to put the past behind them. Zainabi smile and TV. And as I mentioned, uh, Stano has actually drawn a very good picture today, our editorial cartoon that actually uh, shows or epitomizes the state of healthcare in the, in the country and how people are suffering. And we want just to also throw this to our panelists. Health is a big issue. Even we can uh, touch health with security in this country. And uh, uh, I wanted you just to comment on this particular cartoon. We can begin with you, Irungu Hutton, who is Executive Director of Amnesty International. Looking at that editorial cartoon that we have, on the screen right now, and in relation to the story of Murage, just done by Zainab, you know the story. What does it really showcases about our state, or a, yeah, the state of play, as far as healthcare is concerned? So good morning, uh, Debal and uh, fellow panelists, uh, once again. <coughs> so I think the first thing is, uh, I think for me, there's been a lot of attention on Boniface um, Murage, but I think actually the focus really should be on Wangeshi, the uh, mother of the baby that was, um, uh, being held for I think up to four weeks uh, mm -hmm. for this bill of 56,000 shillings. Um, and if anybody has ever wondered what is the cost of the billion scandals, uh, billion shilling scandals that we see within the Ministry of Health or the inability to provide um, free maternal health care um, for uh, all the women and girls in this country that require it, this is really the, f you know, the face of that yes. uh, scandal. And I think for me, um, once again, we're just, uh, you know, there's a, it's a wonderful story in one, it's a very Kenyan story, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's arrested, uh, and actually, let's put it this way. The, a father breaks the law to protect his family. Right? And the question we should ask as Kenyans, what does that mean when somebody actually breaks the law in order to protect a newborn and uh, a, a wife? What does that mean about the system that would lead to somebody essentially putting themselves um, in the position of a criminal? Mm -hmm. The second part of it, which is interesting, is that well-wishers immediately 
flock to support. So yes. we had the offer from the, um, uh, the courageous administrative police officer who um, uh, you know, rescued people in Dusit. We also had uh, the county governor in Nairobi yes. offering to pay the, actually paid the bills and then offering to provide a job. It's a very Kenyan story. But the other part of the Kenyan story is nobody is asking why is our public health system continuing to fail women like Wangeshi? Let me leave it there for the others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let, let's hear from uh, Ambassador Rasas Mwenche. Good morning. Mm. Well, we'll come back later on to a story that we talked about earlier on, but good morning. Uh, we talked about, about so many other stories, <laughs> <laughs> particularly this on the African Union. Okay. But let's talk about this one. Yes, please. Uh, it, it is indeed one of the human rights that is in our constitution that uh, you know access to medicine and all that. And uh, this is one of the four mm -hmm. uh, you know agenda that uh, Kenya is pursuing: health for all. What was interesting, and I want to take build on what Irungwa said, is the determination by the court that actually this was not theft. Mm -hmm. It was denying the hospital funds, precisely for what Irungu has adequately uh, you know, uh, argued on. And, and I think the fundamental issue is that it exposes how people are suffering out there. Um, because when you say that free maternal uh, health services, mm -hmm. What does that free maternal mean? Is a child not the product of that maternal? Are you only recovering the mother? And where does this line stop? Is only mm -hmm. in the private hospital, public hospital? I think this is a question that I would hope that the CS Health should now sit down and reflect on this and, and find a solution because it, it, it's, it's really, there are many families there who are suffering, mm -hmm. who die in homes, because if you go to the hospital and you're mm -hmm. subjected to this kind of thing, then you better stay at home. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about? Because a child being born, that is the beginning of the nation. Mm -hmm. And that we should protect life. If you imprison a child in yes. a hospital, mm -hmm. what are you saying to the nation? Mm -hmm. uh, but we should commend the lawyers and all those that, and even the court, for having reached this mm -hmm. verdict and that this family is home. But how many more we don't know today? Mm -hmm. Mm. We don't know today. Mm. And that's the reality on the ground. Uh, let's hear from uh, Professor Naomi Damba. Dubal, um, two years ago, I addressed the insurance executive in Naivasa. And my focus was the insurance in this country is only focused on a thin layers of people, which is the middle class mm -hmm. and anybody above. And every single person, Mama Mboga, uh, below, is, is not an uh, insurance focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we call, what the English call externalities of the insurance, is that they don't cater for us. And so we won't try. And then insurance is focusing on uh, treating really critical person when people are going to hospital to die. And therefore, somebody can most of the time, I don't say somebody, um, in terms of cancer, mm -hmm. cancer moves from stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Yes. And when you get to stage four, you are about to die. And that is when insurance is responding. So at the university, I said any insurance we must have must provide pre and post natal care. And most of the insurance that we had could not do it, so I asked them mm -hmm. to leave. And mm -hmm. there is only one insurance who come forward, which is now providing pre- and postnatal care, and also pre-screening for mm -hmm. all the university mm -hmm. staff. And I think they are the only insurance, and we are one of four universities which is doing, uh, doing that. So the point is, we need a universal health care, uh, um, a healthy nation cannot be without healthy citizens. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we all need to focus on government role mm -hmm. and also the private sector role, yes. the kind of thing that James Mwangi did mm -hmm. uh, w with the bank system. When Barclays and Standard Bank were um, closing any account that's less than $20,000, mm -hmm. uh, James Mwangi came up with a very innovative program. Mm -hmm. If you have a goat or a few potatoes, Sell it and I'll pen and count for you. Thank you. That is what insurance need to do. Thank you very much. Let's hear from uh, 
for my this morning, Dr. Njoki. I think after this, this, the structural adjustment programs in Kenya, probably the worst thing that happened to us is corporatization of healthcare and corporatization, of course, of many other public goods. And we need to rethink that. It's very sad to see members of parliament and all these leaders throwing gifts and jobs and I think, uh, which is all good, it's very good, especially for Murage yes. and the many other act, uh, p kind of, these kind of things that happen. But we need to go back to policy making and changing the law. I think it's, of course, there are many interests there. The doctors also who, to be honest, also have been quite unethical along the way. Uh, we have insurance companies. There are so many blocks of interests. Um, of course, Kotu, in terms of, and all this have been, over time, I think we've had debates about um, in terms of contributions to, if we actually to make proper contributions for mm -hmm. a universal yes. health care system. But I think it's urgent and the leadership in this country, this, this cases, these two cases, the last two weeks, needs to actually make them um, see that we, we can no longer continue this uh, state of being. It's really, really sad what what this man and, and the woman had to go through. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if uh, Moses uh, Tofa, you have anything to say and regarding this. I know this is uh, such a Kenyan issue, but maybe you've been here and, and, uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, and you yeah, can yeah, tell yes. us uh, your yeah. perspective. And of course, we shall be discussing what is happening in Zimbabwe much, much later. But uh, looking at uh, our healthcare compared to what is happening in Zimbabwe as well. Mm. Is there any comparison? Of course, we know uh, how the economy has been tanking uh, in light of uh, the political scenario uh, in Zimbabwe. Maybe you can just give us a snippet uh, uh, of what you see here and what you've observed also in Zimbabwe. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I think that uh, in terms of the healthcare system in Zimbabwe, yes. the system has been deteriorating over the years especially starting from uh, 2000, when the country started to experience a lot of socioeconomic challenges, mm -hmm. which are actually related to the issue of bad governance, yes. you know, policy paralysis on the part of the government. So if I'm to convey Zimbabwe and Kenya, uh, I will tell you that Kenyan health system, despite the challenges that you are talking of, mm -hmm. is actually far much uh, better. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we have witnessed so many lives which have been lost, mm -hmm. which could have been saved had it been that there is a robust health system in place. If you look at our health, public health uh, institutions, uh, you will be surprised that you go there, you don't find basic, basic uh, uh, stuff mm -hmm. that should be used to take care of patients. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Yes, there are challenges that are here in Kenya, but in Zimbabwe it's a very uh, desperate story in terms of access to health. Mm -hmm. But um, emphasizing on what uh, my colleagues have said, you know, healthcare is uh, very essential, and we need to put the, the human being at the center of any health delivery system, uh, even uh, not only health, but any uh, human endeavor. We have to put the human being in, in, in place. And it is very important to ensure that health services are accessible, especially to those who are marginalized and those who are poor. So mm -hmm. this is a very, very sad story. Mm -hmm. Yes, for Thank Kenya. you. Yes. Thank you, Moses. And uh, just to read also some of your reactions there on social media, we have uh, Stephen Kabuoro, who is saying that uh, Boniface Murage is just one case. There are many more cases mm -hmm. resembling yes. his in this country. Uh, just a reflection there. Also, Bing Charlie says, deep reflection as usual, looking at that particular editorial cartoon over there that was drawn today by, this is uh, Stanoi in the People Daily. And this is what we were discussing, just, a, just the current state of play of a healthcare in this country. Also, Franklin Furaha says, that's, that's what we need as Kenya, uh, to seem or to, see no, or to see no impunity anymore, to see no impunity any, anymore. And those of them are trickling in. We shall be reading uh, some of them on sampling, some of them much, much later in the course of the program. Right, now the ongoing diplomatic row between Kenya and Somalia has taken another twist. A Norwegian exploration firm that marketed Somalia's oil stock in London stated that 
it sourced the product entirely from Somalia's territory. Kenya still insists that Somalia illegally auctioned its oil blocks during an oil conference held on February the 7th in London. Now, NTV's Seth Olale has more details with the letters on the maritime dispute between the two neighboring countries. Spectrum Geo, a Norwegian data consultancy firm that gathered Somalia's oil stock in the Indian Ocean, says it avoided the disputed regions contested by Kenya during its operations. The company is through its executive vice president for Africa, Mediterranean and Middle East region, Graham Mahew, further clarified that it did not market to investors the disputed blocks labeled L21, L23, L24 and L25 as claimed by Kenyan authorities. The statement further indicates that all of the seismic data was acquired wholly within the maritime territory of the federal government of Somalia and no data were acquired within the area currently the subject of the maritime delimitation case with Kenya. The company says the 2D seismic data which covered a total of 20,000 kilometers, depicted oil stocks in 15 blocks, covering water depths of between 30 meters to 4 kilometers. The maritime dispute between the two countries escalated after Kenya's Foreign Affairs Principal Secretary Masharia Kamau on Saturday stated that Somalia had auctioned oil blocks belonging to Kenya during an oil conference held on February 7th in London. The diplomatic row led to the recalling of Kenya and Somalia's ambassadors to their respective countries. Kazi ya fitina, na hile kesi mimi najua wataanguka kwa sababu haina msingi wawote. However, former Defense and Foreign Relations National Assembly Committee Chairman Adam Kainan wants use of negotiations to resolve. It is not in our interest. It is not in the interest of the Republic of Somalia, the people of Somalia, and therefore I want to urge his Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta and His Excellency President Famaj to immediately instruct their respective foreign ministers to sit down and sort out this in the shortest time possible so that this issue is, is, is resolved. The strategic bilateral agreement signed by Kenya and Somalia's foreign affairs ministers last month in Mandera is at stake following the ongoing diplomatic row between the two countries. Seth Olale, NTV, Nairobi. Many thanks indeed, uh, Seth Olale. We shall be discussing that with uh, our panelists much, much later in the course of the program. And uh, we were early discussing about the current state of play of healthcare in this country and looking at the story of Bernard Murage. Now, I want to show you live pictures which are coming through uh, from Status right now. And uh, this is Status. And we have the First Lady with other media personalities and uh, uh, other other people now, right now, well, I can try, is, we, all we can see is, I'll try and get good pictures from there. Of course, this is the joys of uh, live TV, where she's about to launch the fifth, that is the fifth Beyond Zero uh, campaign. And we know what that has really done to this country as far as maternal health care is concerned. And uh, there we go. Those are the pictures right now. At least uh, we can see the first lady. And uh, this is uh, John... What was it? You don't go remind me the name of uh, John Wakihuri. What, what was yeah. the name? Yeah? yeah. Douglas. Douglas, yes, yes, yes. And she's been also a, a personal trainer to the First Lady. There they are. They're warming up. They're just about to launch the, that is, if we just pick the, take the pictures uh, in full screen right now, to launch the fifth Beyond Zero campaign. And uh, we shall be giving you, of course, details of this much, much later in the course of the program. But uh, if I may just cross over to you. Enongu Newton, uh, what the First Lady began, uh, what do you think has actually uh, done to the maternal health care? Has it made any, has it brought any discernible difference as far as that is concerned in relation to what we saw this morning uh, with uh, Morage or that particular story? So f first of all, let me just declare my bias. I'm, I'm a fan of the First Lady, as I call it. Uh, most people call it the First Lady, but I think... Uh, First Lady is probably apt. I like the idea that she's out early exercising with uh, Kenyan runners. She brings together, I think, two sets of um, 
you know, our challenges. One is, of course, to retain our uh, leadership globally as a, you know, a marathon, mm -hmm. um, you know, award-breaking uh, uh, or rather record-breaking nation. But at the same time, also the challenges of maternal health care. So I think she brings that into focus. I've always felt that she's been um, undermined and um, in many ways uh, mm -hmm. her efforts have been um, uh, sabotaged by the corruption that we've seen in the health ministry, not just um, at the level of the national ministry, but even at the county government level. Um, and many times, I think, if you go back, the last time I think she ran a marathon was just, was just before the um, uh, six, six billion or five billion uh, scandal, the so-called Mafia House scandal that mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. happened in 2000, I think 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. And that really, they were, she went on pause after that because I think probably what was um, understood by the, um, uh, you know, by government officers that, that she would no longer be able to essentially rally the nation on a maternal health care agenda mm -hmm. in the uh, presence of such corruption. And I think um, looking back at those two things, mm -hmm. what for me is still present is that in many ways, despite the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission report on the Ministry of Health, they did a systems audit mm -hmm. and they confirmed quite a bit of what had been essentially leaked by the uh, internal auditor back in, um, uh, uh, you know, back during the time of the six million, six, six to five mi billion mm -hmm. scandal. Um, my sense is that not much has changed. Um, many donors have pulled out of uh, the health budget. Um, they no longer fund us um, because of the um, scandals related to that particular incident, but also the Gavi scandal, where <laughs> money was um, essentially mis misallocated um, and uh, paid back without any uh, body being held uh, responsible for that. Um, so I think you know those, those would be my views, that once we are able to close the um, loopholes for corruption within mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health, and within our county governments, yes. we are going to be able to see um, a country that can declare not just piloted uh, universal health care, but really national universal health care uh, across the country. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, the pictures are very sporty. They're tearing on air right now. The, that is, of course, our, our love pictures coming from State House. Once they stabilize, we shall be showing you uh, this particular fifth launch of the Beyond the Zero campaign, which has gone you know, farther to make sure that maternal health care in this country uh, is also uh, raised up to a very good, uh, maybe solid, uh, what I should say, uh, antenna as far as health care is concerned and uh, mothers who are suffering in the hospitals as far as bills are, are concerned. Maybe, Ambassador, you can just comment on this as far as uh, <coughs> the Beyond Zero is, com is, com is concerned and Joki as well. Let's talk about the principle behind this because um, if you look at statistics, about 90% of women in Kenya do get uh, pre uh, what do you call it? Prenatal, Prenatal uh, access to services to a qualified professional that you know assists them in terms of the. the, 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 the the fetus, how the, 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 the baby's you know, faring on. But when you go further down the road, when it comes to delivery, mm -hmm. less than 50% of births take place in hospital. Yes. And if you look at, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, demography in terms of deaths, Kenya records about 500 in about 10,000 mm -hmm. uh, births that die. Mm. The statistics, particularly in developing in developed countries, is below 50. So that tells you there's something wrong from those statistics. Mm -hmm. You can read there's something wrong. Beyond Zero campaign is meant to that if a mother is giving to life, that mother should be protected and equally the child should be protected. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this really should bring us to what uh, Professor was articulating early on particularly the role of government and insurance companies. This cannot be just government alone. Mm -hmm. Granted, the government should provide the leadership, but I think we sh here is an opportunity. The problem with our insurance companies, they are extortionists. Mm -hmm. They can only insure you if they think you will not die. They, they do a model where they see what is the probability that the bird might die soon, and they will check on your hospital data. Mm -hmm. In fact, this situation now as we move to biometric, the, the insurance will be getting all that debt. They can even get into consultation to know the probability for your debt and refuse your insurance. Mm -hmm. And this is a big issue globally, but also in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But here's a problem. Because if you look at the death rates, 
against the population. Yes. If you get uh, the population to ensure, the hospital will still make money as a service. And they may not make handsome profits, but you will protect the life. Nobody is being proactive to look at the potential. Today, you and I, I don't know how it is with you, but there is no week that ends without participating in a funeral. Nobody is, for instance, ensuring on how we can protect the people once they have a loss in the family. They have already spent all the money they had in the hospital, then there is a funeral, and unfortunately in Kenya, funerals are a big time thing. Mm -hmm. So that by the time a loved one has died, a family is left very poor. Mm -hmm. In fact, in w a very bad state. So this is a very serious matter that we should all deliver it and, and come up with innovative tools to save you know, the suffering people out there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Dr. Njoki? I think it's just probably like what um, Ambassador here is saying. We need to get, the government needs to really uh, rein on insurance companies mm -hmm. and also for those insurance companies to, to remember first, we are all human. I think saving lives is the most important thing. But also, uh, every week, everybody is contributing towards hospital bills in Kenya yes. beyond, f on, and then the funeral. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we need to do something about it. Insurance mm -hmm. companies, the government, and I hope beyond zero, what uh, uh, the first lady is doing, she can start to lobby more. I know she comes off also as um, just help, trying to help the healthcare system, but I think given the role she has been playing, mm -hmm. she needs to now actually take up a role advocating for uh, better regulations and a more humane also insurance system. So even talking to insurance companies and also the doctors who are also ex largely also doing a lot of extortionist work. Mm -hmm. Doctors and insurance companies. And so poor Kenyans are left to the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really sad. If you don't have money in this country, it's only God who can save. It's so sad. It's sad. Yeah. Right, thank you. Unless, uh, Professor Nomi Dambo, you have something to add on it? I'd like to congratulate uh, the First Lady uh, for continuing uh, this effort um, to put it uh, um, in the public. And uh, the world is a crisis. Uh, it's a crisis that should not reach the stage where it is, where this young man has to carry his baby in a bag, uh, we can do better as a country mm -hmm. uh, based on the stage of our development right now. Thank you. Right. That's Professor Naomi Damba. And uh, as soon as we have our pictures stabilized, we shall also be uh, showing you this particular fifth launch of the Beyond the Zero campaign. Earlier we did that, but uh, uh, of course uh, that uh, transmission is not very, very stable right now. But back to a topic this morning, uh, we shall be discussing a lot of issues with the panelists. Where Seth Olale just read a story on the new development on the Kenya and Somalia uh, diplomatic row. Yesterday also we had this particular editorial cartoon uh, from Victor. Uh, it's all about what is happening right now. Setting the record straight, um, the gingo still is a ticklish issue. But let's just come to this particular issue of Somalia and Kenya right now. This has been fixated on uh, the media for the, the last or oh, the past one week. Mm -hmm. And we have new uh, revelations as far as the South is concerned with new firm now saying, uh, you know, some of those marked territories belong to Somalia as well. I don't know where we are. This is a diplomatic issue and we, I need to pick your brains also, Ambassador Erasmus mm -hmm. Moncha and the rest of us as far as this is concerned. I know this is a story you've been following. Uh, so uh, what are your concerns uh, and what is your input on this as well? <coughs> I think I like to approach this matter from two aspects. First, one of the principles that govern borders, mm -hmm. and the second one is this incident and how it has played out. Mm -hmm. Now, starting with the principles, uh, one of the things that the OAU did uh, when it was established in way back in 1963 mm -hmm. was to say that for Africa to avoid the situation that we are going to go into war, like Europe did and others, let us accept that the boundaries that were inherited from the colonial powers mm -hmm. will be respected. So that's the first principle. Mm -hmm. Then there is a second aspect which talks about principles of border uh, dispute. Now, how do you arrive at amicable solutions mm -hmm. when there is a dispute, particularly mm -hmm. where there is no clear demarcation 
Uh, and there are many instances like this Megingo where people are saying mm -hmm. this is where the beacon is and, uh, and so forth. There are three principles here that are normally employed. Uh, one is what you may call then the trajectory process. That's what is in dispute here. Somalia saying follow the trajectory of the border as it comes from the land, then mm -hmm. you extend it to the sea. But there is also a principle of latitudinal, but that is more or less like an understanding. This is a global principle. There is also a third one which talks of equidistance. You look at the issue and then you say half. I say all this because in Africa, there are many border disputes, and many of them have been solved amicably, mm -hmm. but where there is a you know, lack of understanding, then you go to International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a border issue. Uh, you know what has happened between Ethiopia and Eritrea. There is Senegal, Gambia. There is, uh, you know, Nigeria, Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So many of them. And Kenya has had its own share. There, now, let's come to the history of it. This is not the first time Kenya is facing this challenge with Somalia. Yes. Don't forget that in the 60s, Somalia had that policy of greater Somalia. Mm -hmm and wanted to claim all territories that, uh, you know, were in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and Kenya literally went into war, not literally, went into war. Mm -hmm. And that war was solved within the context of the OAU. Now, where are we today here? Uh, to me, it looks like there's been a practice, there's been a, an agreement, and this practice, which has been on for 40 years, mm -hmm. there seems to have been an, under, uh, an understanding. When this map was presented in Europe, which clearly showed that it was departing from that practice, mm -hmm. that to me then the question is, how do you engage each other? I'm not sure that all the processes, particularly the initial processes, were well exhausted. Mm -hmm. Before you go public mm -hmm. and raise public sentiments, I think it would have been, in my view, first of all, someone, the ambassador from, uh, from you know, uh, Mogadishu, mm -hmm. then uh, send the ambassador with a protest note to talk to the government. Mm -hmm. At the same time, summon the Somali ambassador here. But it looks to me that the next step that we went is to expel the ambassadors, if that's what is in the media is right. Mm -hmm. Now, that ex escalates tension. But fortunately, I think Somalia said, well, there, there was nothing like an auction. There's nothing like, uh, uh, you know, but the map that clearly shows that that's the map they presented. The case is before the court. Somalia would have been foolhardy to go ahead and use this when the case is in the court. And I think that's why Somalia has taken this back step to say no, because it knows that that would be in violation. Kenya was reluctant to go to court, but I think given the circumstances and given what, in, in fact, even the, the former Attorney General did say before, <laughs> that yes, Kenya was going to go to court. I think now that the matter is before court, we should encourage the two nations to go there because as neighbors, a, a border is highly motive. It can bring a lot of problems. In fact, in the African Union, there is a border program that monitors borders. Once you see that, you, you try to help countries reach amicable solution. All right, mm -hmm. let's hear from uh, Elongi Hutton mm -hmm. on this. So, so I guess, uh, you know, my, my nieces and nephews would probably say that um, we had a small uh, tiff between uh, Somalia and Kenya over the last five days. Um, I think that's the way it's put. I mean, I think the issue is um, obviously quite important for the country. Oil and gas um, is, you know, has been embedded in Kenya's strategy for several years now in terms of uh, economic growth. Um, I think um, Ambassador Munch is, you know, is, is really spot on when he talks about what are the delineation, maritime delineation principles mm -hmm. that we're using and why haven't we resolved them? And perhaps did we move very quickly to um, essentially declare uh, a break in diplomatic relations uh, for, this, for this last weekend? Tomorrow the Cabinet Secretary will be before the um, uh, Defence Committee, the Defence and Foreign Relations Committee to explain uh, the current situation. One, one would just hope that, um, and I think I saw last night, that the TIF may be over, that there's some backdoor uh, diplomacy yes. that has begun. Hmm. And therefore, um, the threat, I think, that was there on Saturday night, uh, which was slightly veiled in the statement by the PS uh, for Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, um, Ambassador Masharia, 
which was that it might affect a whole range of things. I mean, it might affect, for example, our support, our military support for the Somalia government. Mm -hmm. It might affect uh, the Dadaab uh, camp. In fact, there was some talk about uh, a six-month uh, deadline has already been issued to close the Dadaab. I don't know how true that is. Um, but it, the, the costs were very high. And I think my major concern was that um, uh, Somali refugees um, would not be used as hostages in this oil and gas yes. uh, negotiation that is happening between the two governments. Um, and furthermore, also that we don't destroy or harm what has essentially been good relationships between Somali people and Kenyan people. Um, somebody posted a very interesting uh, uh, piece uh, back in the 1960s, which really showed how much support Somalia gave the Kenyan nationalists before we became independent. Mm -hmm. And we, ha you know, we have short memory spans, but actually if we go back um, 60, 70 years, it was at one point the Somalis that were helping our nationalists to fight against the British. And I think we shouldn't forget that long history that's there between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Right, Dr. Njoki. I think first we need to also appreciate the context, which it was sad also maybe the, the reactions, uh, the threats probably were not, um, were not uh, thought well thought about. But if you look at the context first of dwindling oil reserves around the world, this is not unique to Kenya. Globally, there are probably about eight global flashpoints where we have contested territory claims. And especially mm -hmm. now with oil and gas reserves from South China Sea, the Falklands, I, the Falkland Islands, mm -hmm. the Arctic Ocean, um, that's contested territory again between Canada, Russia, and Denmark mm -hmm. in the Arctic mm -hmm. Ocean, East China Sea, the Gulf of Thailand, Caribbean Sea again mm -hmm. between Nicaragua, mm -hmm. Colombia, and Costa Rica again with similar, mm -hmm. uh, with similar. Um, what is actually it's very similar to what's happening in Kenya, like for instance in the Caribbean Sea, where Nicaragua has granted oil licenses. To, 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 to prospective mm -hmm. miners. And then, of course, Timor Leste and Australia. The Caspian Sea has been, of course, a global flashpoint again around um, ter contested territory claims. But the oil, oil and gas reserves bring in more, uh, of course, bring in, in, in the contestation. So I think this is not unique to Kenya, but of course, I'm not saying this, that we should not be. Uh, put in the, the the effort and the important that this is a very important thing that needs to be resolved. But this is an issue that happens around the world because of contested contested uh, borders and also, of course, dwindling oil reserves. So it's a global issue, and I think we should be more measured and look to the International Court of Justice to deal with these issues. Right. When we circle back, we'll hear from Dr. Moses uh, Tofa on that as well, and Professor Noah Migdamba uh, on uh, the Kenya and Somali diplomatic row as far as the borderlines are concerned, that is the maritime borderline. And this uh, story is with the International uh, Court of Justice. So we'll see you on the other side of the break. Of course, I appreciate your comments on our hashtag, which is AMLiveNTV. AMLiveNTV is a powerful name on Facebook and 20686 is our SMS portal. Use the hashtag, hashtag AMLiveNTV. Thank you.
Well, for back you watching, standing on guard where we're keeping an eye on the enemy, and the eye is on the maritime border and the row that is continuing between Kenya and Somalia. We promise to circle back with uh, Naomi Damba and Dr. Moses Tofa to hear what they have to say about this particular new development so far, as the Norwegian firm has confirmed that, yes, they made a business uh, or had a business transaction with uh, Somalia, and some of those deposits were within the Somalian border. Uh, borders. Let, let's just hear from Moses Tofa. Uh, I think uh, you, my, uh, you will gloss over it. Let's hear from uh, <laughs> Professor Naomi Damba. <laughs> the bulk, my uh, um, uh, team here have enumerated a number of issues, but let me uh, um, divert a little bit. Uh, the implication is serious uh, for both countries. Um, we see that uh, 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 we have been sending about 20 planes of Mera, loaded every day down to three. Uh, Somalians are buying more kites from Ethiopia than uh, uh, Mera from Kenya. Jubiland has imposed heavy tax on us. Uh, Kenya hosts the largest refugees, as we know. Uh, potential affecting thousands of Somalia in Kenya is very serious. Uh, we have to coexist, we have to live together. But here's my point. My point is the first time we went to Somalia was to serve the best national interest of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that should be the primary goal and continue to be. So there are several things that need to happen. One, we must use all diplomatic efforts um, to calm down uh, the situation and solve it. But we also need to have a contingency plan. Yes, if what if uh, aid does not work, then we must be able to have a very clear plan on where we go. Number one, we need to draw the line on the sand that say this is a contested zone. And unless, unless there is amicable understanding on the way forward or the court come down one way or, or another. There should not be any exploration at all uh, by any entity on this zone. Mm -hmm. And the same thing needs to happen to Migingo. Uh, and then we need to um, perhaps uh, use very effective backdoor diplomacy mm -hmm. or, or, or appoint a special um, a diplomatic person to deal with issues because the the implication for both countries in the long term is very serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Just uh, one word. Ambassador. I hate to say this, but uh, I, uh, first of all, I, I, you know, I, I'm coming from a theory that uh, we must be careful not to be lured into war by those who are perhaps who don't have good intentions for us. Mm -hmm. And this is the point I'm trying to make. This oil has been known to exist here for us many decades but no one wanted to exploit it they just left it there mm -hmm. now they see that we are ready to start embarking on that they want us to get into war with somalia so that we don't even exploit it mm -hmm. and we'll be impoverished because we'll divert all our attention so that we start fighting so we must resist those efforts out there that are because anybody who was auctioning this and particularly these western farms which mm -hmm. were coming to buy what due diligence did they do mm -hmm. to see that this is not a contested land? I mean, when you are going to buy a house, the first thing you do is due diligence to see that this is, uh, you know, uh, a property that does no encumbrances. And that anybody trying to do it is talking fire. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be lured into this. We must resist to go through along the lines that my colleagues have uh, articulated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is a developing story. Uh, of course, we shall be having more revelations and news on it. And we should put tails on that and discuss also that much, much uh, later in the course of the day or even next week here on Standing on Get. But I see also reactions on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, that uh, Bing Charlie saying the, the thief is unfortunate and called for and will have untold consequences if diplomatic channels are not adequately and exhaustively uh, stated. Also, we have uh, Opakasi Jackson saying that Exactly, Erastus. Uh, we have Kenyans who cannot even afford 20 shillings to buy a receipt, and, uh, and health wants such people uh, to NHIF. The CS must reflect on that. Uh, this is commenting on earlier what we were discussing 
as far as healthcare is concerned and the story of Morage. Also, we do have Dr. Paul or Paul M. Ksafi saying, I'm Paul from Nairobi. I think some statements are just taken for pleasure since they are not uh, reality. My DSS just define what free means first. And uh, we have also Kimani Mali saying that uh, the BM0 campaign is a noble idea. But the First Lady is in a better position to help the President fight corruption, especially in the Ministry of Health. I believe her heart is in the right place, but corruption will kill it. This is what we have uh, from Kimani Mali as well. So let's hear what you have to say as far as some of uh, the stories we've done this morning and discussed are concerned as well. But for now, we want to see what is happening on the international scene. Now, the main opposition candidate in Nigeria's postponed vote condemned a command by the country's incumbent president, Muhammadu Buhari, for a ruthless response by the military and police to vote tampering. Atiku Abu Bakr, the presidential candidate for the People's Democratic Party, PDP, called the comments shocking and said soldiers and police officers were not bound to execute. <laughs> is concerned if we may just pick it up this is what uh, it looks like this morning and we have a panelist here also to comment on this and uh, that particular pronouncement by Muhammadu he says with his confusion the winner will be declared the loser the loser and the loser will be declared the winner that is Atiku and Buhari uh, let's hear from uh, Inongo Huto especially when uh, pronouncement like this uh, if we may try to juxtapose it with the human rights and of course mm. you have a pronouncement from the president use whatever means to try and you know control vote tampering so, so I think you know the, obviously everybody is, is edgy I think in in Nigeria the stakes are high um, it um, is obviously a two uh, I don't know if those are horses but it's obviously a two horse race uh, between Atiku and, and Buhari um, and I think the second thing really is um, it happens in the context of, of quite a bit of violence. I mean, I think one of the moments we should pause also to just commiserate. Um, uh, last week, um, you know, Nigeria has these high numbers of um, killings that happen. You know, so last week, 130 people died in the, the northern part of the country. And, and um, you know, my, my always concern with, uh, with Nigeria is that um, uh, the country has a degree of restlessness that can produce large-scale violence if not handled carefully. I think the Buhari statement, for me, I heard it more of um, a commitment that the elections will be free and fair and that um, they will use all the security services to make sure that's the case. Mm -hmm. But obviously the Atiku uh, camp see this as um, uh, a declaration of militar you know, militarizing the election and therefore that the election will be rigged. So I think this is the, the tension that we've, we have between the two uh, candidates. And uh, I think the longer that it goes on, um, you know, let's hope that there's no further postponement in the elections. Um, there was a, with a light touch, somebody said, you know, that the management uh, of elections across Africa um, is so prone to inefficiencies and logistical problems that perhaps we should give it to Coca-Cola or to DHL to manage. <laughs> Light touch. Please Light don't, take, touch. Yeah, don't take this seriously anywhere. <laughs> no. Any of the electoral commissions across Africa, if you're watching, particularly Zimbabwe, don't take it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear from Moses. Huh? Yes. Uh, you know, um, I think this statement is very unfortunate, especially considering the context where tensions are very high and the president of a country is... Uh, saying that if you tamper with uh, the elections, 
you won't do that at the expense of your life. Yes, the idea is he is trying to protect the integrity of the elections, which is very important, and which and especially given given that the postponement of the election has raised a lot of issues, has raised a lot of doubts in terms of whether the elections will be free, fair, and credible. Mm -hmm. But when a leader says such a statement, it, it, is, it is very, uh, very disturbing because people uh, take seriously such statements. In, the, in Zimbabwe, we have seen such statements being uh, said by leaders, and we have seen a lot of violence taking place. We have seen security forces brutalizing people mm -hmm. because of that particular statement. You can uh, talk about the integrity of elections without really needing to use the mm -hmm. terms such as ruthlessness, such as you will do that at the expense of your life. So for me, that was very, very unfortunate, although the intention is to try and mm -hmm. ensure that the elections are free, fair, and credible. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Njoki. I think the tensions, the current tensions with the, this election, of course, is a very close contest, very close. Nobody knows who might win. Uh, there have been no polls, so there have been no opinion polls about, because there, no, I mean, there have been no opinion polls carried out on this election. So it's it's quite uh, it's quite it's quite uh, it's out there. No one knows what will win. And so any statement, any any issue, whether it's to do with violence, even the postponement of the election, has brought a lot of um, not a, a bit of uncertainty. And and given Buhari's also the challenges that Buhari's regime has had the last couple of years, rising unemployment. Uh, violent extremism in the north, and of course issues of corruption, it 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 kind of brings in now a, it, it kind of complicates now a context that is already uh, quite tense. And of course, Atiku is 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 is, is like is, is of course taking advantage of <coughs> the situation to to take any any statement of course made by the, the former president or the current president as something that could be injurious to the elections. But I think this is a very closely contested election and and it's it's very interesting because unlike other elections we've had in Africa maybe the last two years where it was almost not quite clear but you can see where it's going, we don't know what will happen mm -hmm. come Saturday. Ambassador, this is not the first time that actually they've been postponing elections. Uh, I think even the previous uh, election they had to do this uh, without any rhyme or reason, because people are saying, I mean, w what is the main reason for actually postponing? Because they say they were not really prepared. But we had the, the uh, INEC, uh, that, the, that is a body handling the, the election in Nigeria, you know, saying, yeah, we are gang ho, we are uh, locked and loaded, ready to go. Then a sudden now turn and speaking from both sides of the mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, the pal was spot on. And I, I was going to build on what precisely you have said. You look at the history of INEC, mm -hmm. uh, even in the previous election. Uh, in fact, INEC had to postpone because in certain areas uh, things were happening which were not perhaps uh, in line with, you know, conducting of the election, and so they postponed it to make sure that things were okay. I listened to the uh, head of the AU Observer Mission, uh, former Prime Minister of. Uh, uh, Ethiopia, uh, I had a Mariam, who said very clearly that from where he stands, he really attributes this to lack of proper planning and efficiency. And this, to me, gives credence to what we know of INEC, because you may remember the last election. Mm -hmm. It was also a very close call, just like this one. Mm. And towards the end of the election, Government was claiming that time was uh, President Jonathan, and now it is Buhari. Mm -hmm. uh, government was claiming that the opposition was rigging, and uh, the opposition was also claiming that the government, in fact, to announce the election, it took quite some, you know, tension. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting all night wondering whether yes. the election was going to be called because there was pressure from both governments not to announce. Mm -hmm. And if you know the build up to this election, there has been, an environment has not been very good. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember the case of the Chief Justice, yes. it was attributed to that kind of, okay, if there's a close call, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. right. and, and, and that has built suspicion. There is an air of, you know, uh, suspicion 
on both sides, mutual suspicion. And I think this is an early warning that every effort should be made to make sure that Africa is on guard to avoid the crisis in Nigeria. And, and one hopes that uh, this election is, comes out well. But in a nutshell, it is a question of inefficiency. INEC has a good track record, and that, unfortunately, in the environment it is, has created this suspicion. Mm -hmm. Professor Naomi Damba. Uh, Duban, this is unfortunate uh, development. Uh, Nigeria is the largest uh, in terms of population, largest economy, and can do better at this time of um, uh, Africa development. And uh, the, like my colleagues here have uh, articulated, there's some really um, concerns, uh, some real serious issues. But one of the things has been Bahari's help. Um, uh, I mean, the question is, why did, why did he choose to run again? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what value had is he going to bring mm -hmm. in this second term uh, from the previous one? Mm -hmm. And then postponing election yes. is one of the serious developments you, you can bring. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is somebody out there uh, staffing the teams um, like they have done all over Africa? And so there's a lot of suspicion on this and whether or not the final thing election is going to be credible. There's going to be a lot of questions. Okay, right. Uh, Moses, you have something to say? Oh, yes. Uh, I want to say the first thing is that if you look at the, the, the time that the election was postponed, it was it, a few hours before mm -hmm. the vote began. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they use, the, they, they cite primarily two reasons as to why they postponed the election. Mm -hmm. One reason is that they were not able to distribute ballot papers and other election materials to particular regions of the country because of bad weather and they had to rely on ground transportation. Mm -hmm. And the other reason is that uh, three or so of their offices got bad and they lost a lot of uh, election material. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether those reasons are really credible reasons to postpone an election. Uh, and it is very important for election management bodies, learning from Zimbabwe's experience, not only to be credible, but to be perceived as credible, yes. to be seen as credible. Mm -hmm. Because once there is that question, in Zimbabwe, that's one of the reasons why we had the August 1 violence and the shootings, because people lost the confidence mm -hmm. in the way the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission was handling their votes. So it is very important for election management bodies in Africa to be perceived as credible and able to deliver a free and fair election. All right, thank you. Right, let's move on and to see also what is happening in Senegal uh, as well. But before we go there, we have the Daily Monitor, which uh, has a very interesting story as well. Uh, when you look at that, NRM top organ endorses Museveni for 2021 polls. So this is, uh, you know, cut and dry as far as Museveni is concerned. It's going to be uh, in that poll as well. The resolution by the party's Central Executive Committee will now be taken to the National Executive Committee at the National Delegates Conference before a final call can be made. So we have leaders who will still be hanging on power in Egypt the same day, 2034. Uh, we know the president also is gagging to actually run until uh, he, he will be in power until 2034, also in Rwanda the same. So what is really happening? And this is the question I've been really raising, uh, especially in Africa and extensions, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's not uh, you being the president, but even here we're grappling with the issue of the referendum. We don't know what, how that will pan out. And of course, uh, sentiments are, yes, this may be ease because some people want also to, you know, still be in power somewhat or be relevant even after the 10 years mm -hmm. of, uh, of the term. Irongo, briefly on it before we so move so on think, to I see what is happening. I think the first thing we know, and this is an obvious point, is political legitimacy is like oxygen for states and for government. If you mm -hmm. do not have political legitimacy, then you cannot govern uh, inclusively, democratically, and effectively. I think that's the, the starting point. Um, and I think what we've seen across the continent is where you have a smooth transition and um, a two-term, uh, I guess, policy for governments. Um, those are the societies that are the most stable. Where you see third-termism or you see extensions of, uh, you know, extensions of presidential terms, that is the place where you see most uh, turmoil and destabilization of the national political um, fabric. So I think the last point for me is transitions for leadership are always the most important conversations. Leaders tend to forget this, that actually it's not so important <coughs> how you me. govern when you're in charge. It is really how you lay the conditions 
for new leaders to emerge mm -hmm. um, that are able to carry forward national values and national, um, a national culture that is open and democratic. Um, and I don't think uh, Uganda has got it right yet, uh, or rather, not Uganda, I think this is just a decision of the NRM top organ. All right. Now, President Maki Sal is the strong favorite to win Senegal's election on Sunday, boosted by a modernizing fast term that propelled economic growth, although critics accuse him of jailing his rivals for political gain. Sal, who is 57, is facing four contenders in the first round of the voting, the smallest presidential field since 1988, after two of the Senegal's best known opposition figures were ruled out because of corruption convictions. Rights groups say this.
comment on the Senegal election and uh, the U.S. election and also the Iran-U.S. Uh, nuke deal, which is, oh, is slated. Uh, this is the second summit on the 27th and the 28th of this, this month. Well, you can begin with Senegal or yeah, whichever place I do want to begin the with. One, the one that I wanted to tackle was, uh, was Senegal because yes. I think I've been watching it a little bit uh, from a distance. Uh, <coughs> last year, we, um, as Amnesty, we raised concerns with the, the nature of the trials that were um, being preferred against uh, some of the pre presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. um, they were, as I think as the news piece talked about, they were really related to corruption uh, scandals. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were very concerned that the um, impending elections would not be used as a pretext for essentially doing what is an exercise in integrity and uh, criminal justice. Um, this uh, last month or so, I think we've been very concerned about the number of uh, people that have got hurt. I think 11 people have lost their lives in the last, um, uh, probably about the last two months or so mm -hmm. of the elections. The elections are getting increasingly violent and um, <coughs> a number of human rights organizations uh, in Senegal have actually begun to put pressure on the um, uh, on Macky Sall and the other uh, uh, candidates yes. to make sure that they urge restraint and that they um, hold back um, the, the, their supporters who may decide in this moment to become more violent. So I think for me that's the um, I think that uh, you, know, uh, you know I think is the challenge in the context of the lead up to the elections on the 24th. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Russell's ambassador. Uh, just in addition to what Irungu has said, Actually, if you look at Africa and unfortunately globally, democracy is receding. Mm. And democracy is receding because we have a new generation of leaders that seem to forget where we have come from. Because we went through the 60s and went through dictatorial regimes. And at the turn of this century, we saw Africa emerging very strong. And some of the pillars for growth, uh, as rightly mentioned in the story of. Uh, uh, Senegal. Of course, in addition to infrastructure being uh, a growth pole, there was also the question of commodities, but also political stability and macroeconomic prudence. Mm -hmm. All these are being thrown mm -hmm. out of the window because mm -hmm. of corruption and the rest. Now, what is happening in uh, Senegal is very sad because, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at from the history of all these people, Senegal, and then now you are coming to Ward, Ward was a very promising leader. But towards the end, he wanted to cling to power. Mm -hmm. And it, it took really good effort to get him out. And now Max Sall is going the same direction, using uh, state tools to really subjugate the, 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 I mean the, the opponents to all sorts of crime. This is not right. And, and of course, you will see that uh, some people, Parkham particularly, if you are in wood books with uh, Paris, they will look the other side. And that's what has happened with election after election in Africa. It's a question of where is Paris standing? Who is Paris standing? Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Njoki. Yes, um, I would probably want to f also look at elections and also the rise of the right wing. There's, uh, for the last couple of years, the right wing in Europe, in America, and that's where Trump uh, finds a lot of um, comrades even in, 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 in Europe because there's the, right, the rise of the right wing. Mm -hmm. If you look at France, Le Pen, and even what's happening now with the yellow uh, movement or Gilets mm -hmm. Jaunes and infiltration again by those right wing elements like the anti-Semitists. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a lot of, I think it's, it's, it's something that we need to think about. In, in the African context, it's kind of different because you have people like Museveni, who got in as a serious left wing, or Ab Abdullahi Wad, and how eventually they become something different 33 years later, mm -hmm. and how they're using the state to legitimize themselves. And so I think there's a lot of, there's need for vigilance. The AU, I think, needs to do something, because the African Union is very clear on unconstitutional change of government mm -hmm. when you have a coup, but they don't seem to have clarity when a president decides to extend his, his, his leadership. Mm -hmm. So that, it seems there's a lacuna mm -hmm. in the law or in, in the African Union governance, uh, democracy and governance charter. So, and it's also interesting to see um, in, in the US, Bernie Sanders, I have a soft spot for Bernie. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I 
I find, and I, I like even the, the, what he's saying right now. I think he's one person who has a lot of clarity on what is ailing America. And it's sad that, um, it's, it's, it's sad what, what's going on, and of course with, with Trump, and it's going to be interesting to see whether also uh, Bernie, also in his late 70s, just like Trump, mm -hmm. is going to succeed in this election. But uh, all the best to him. I have a lot of respect for Bernie Sanders. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, Tofa, you think uh, that <laughs> particular ship has sailed as far as Bernie is concerned? He had a good appeal then. Does he still hold that appeal uh, coming to, of course, this general election that they're going to be holding, I think, this year? Uh, maybe they wanted to, uh, sorry, to... Yeah, sure, sure, go on. Yes, to, to comment on the uh, Senegal election. There's something that I wanted to mm -hmm. say about those elections in terms of uh, electoral politics in Africa. That, you know, uh, when you use elections to give yourself a veneer of legitimacy. That is the, the most Im important issue that we need to address in Africa, the issue of legitimacy. Because if you fail on the issue of legitimacy, which comes through the conduct of free and fair elections, it is very difficult to, to, to govern the country. So there is one input legitimacy and there's output legitimacy. If you fail on input legitimacy, you are likely to fail on output legitimacy. So we find ourselves in a, in, in a situation where our states do not have both the legitimacy that comes with elections and the legitimacy that comes with performance. Yes. You cannot perform well if you do not have the legitimacy <coughs> because even those who would have lost the elections will contest the outcome, <laughs> will contest the process, will withdraw their consent to be governed. So it's a very important issue that we need to address as far as uh, mm -hmm. elections mm -hmm. in Africa is okay. concerned. Okay. Professor Naomi <coughs> uh, The one that we uh, talk about um, Senegal in general, and then I uh, need to say something about U.S. election. I think there are two things uh, from the African scene, and whether you talk about Congo, we talk about Zambia, talk about Senegal, you talk about Uganda. Um, one is we never, as African, um, come up and compromise on the meaning of democracy. Uh, the, we are so far away from what I would call Jeff Jeff uh, Jefferson democracy, and uh, we are something else. We've also played with the idea of African socialism uh, at the beginning in the 60s, mm -hmm. and then that whatever that meant uh, sort of died. Second point is the corruption element yes. uh, where people at Museveni can begin with really noble idea and then end up where he is and uh, you know Congo uh, everywhere and, and now we are seeing that in Senegal. These people are fighting to keep their loot. Uh, they're, they're not sure who else is going to come mm -hmm. and the consequence of that. That's the very, consi uh, very, very consistent um, consistent, documented evidence. And therefore, when they are asking for more time, it's not to serve or bring any, any value added to the country, but to keep their loads. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you, you Just a quick question. Sure. <coughs> I, I wanted to comment on a point, uh, and rightly so, that in your case raised concerning the lacuna that the is law. there, particularly in the constitutional process in Africa. If you look at uh, the dispensation that prevailed, particularly at the turn of this century, Africa had agreed to that there must be at least term limits in terms of leadership in the continent. But you can see this is being challenged okay. in many countries. Uh, and and, and uh, there, there was a scholarly you know, study on this by you know, African lawyers and the rest to say, when is a process not legitimate? Because if you look at the constitution like this constitution here, the very first words say, we, the people of Kenya, give ourselves yep. this constitution. Mm -hmm. Then if the people of Kenya decides to change this constitution and they say remove a two-term limit, uh, do you say that is legitimate? The question then is how it's done. Because when leaders want to change it, I mean, 
we know what elections mean in Africa. Mm -hmm. they, they, they change it and say it's the people who changed it, mm -hmm. and the people have given themselves a constitution. Mm -hmm. So there is a very serious process right. as to say how legitimate was that process. And, and, and unless then that process is consensual, you bring all the people together, people agree, uh, so then they can say, let's change the constitution. Then that is flawed. Having said that, and, and I think it's important to, to mention this, as Africa, we must then go back and ask ourselves, why was there this process of, say, presidential limits? Mm -hmm. uh, some say, well, you don't have in Germany, you don't have in UK. You mm -hmm. say, it is something that we should debate and come to a conclusion because elections or succession, uh, democratic transitions become a, process, mm -hmm. a problem. Just a quick note on my sister here, who seems to be a leftist. Uh, <laughs> says, uh, my, but you know, this is the problem now. When you look at the global politics, mm -hmm. we are either leftist or rightist. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you can see what has happened in the UK. The Labour MPs who have uh, resigned, they are saying the party has been captured by the leftist. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the conservatives are saying the party has been captured by rightist. Mm -hmm. This is what is ailing America. The, 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 the Republican Party was captured by the right, rightist, mm -hmm. the Tea Party and the rest. And this is the extremism we have. Extremism is not only in religion and the rest, it is also coming in our politics. We live in a really momentous period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, and leftist and, uh, politics uh, is very progressive politics <laughs> compared <laughs> to right wing <laughs> politics any day. Any day. <laughs> any day. Right, let, let's come back to Irungi Hilton because I think mm -hmm. also uh, Dr. Njoki raised a very pertinent issue. We had the, uh, the, the, the summit, the African Union summit, just uh, some weeks ago. I, I think last week it ended on Monday. And she's raised the question of uh, when it, when it, when it, what does it really mean when we have these particular sessions? Do we talk about issues that really are pertinent within Africa, or we gloss over issues like yeah, term extensions, mm -hmm. right? And we talk about infrastructure, but the pertinent issues of governance, that is a critical issue that has been raised by Joki. Who sets the agenda when we have these particular sessions on what they're going to discuss? And why do they leave pertinent issues like term extensions, what is happening in Egypt, what is happening now uh, with, uh, with Rwanda and Uganda, looking at the headlines as well? Why do they pussyfoot, uh, pussyfoot around these particular issues and not tackle them at the African Union? Mm -hmm. And the ambassador will tell us, yeah, yeah he's been uh, the deputy chair of uh, AU as well. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to start by saying that it's a bit like asking the Uber driver rather than the passenger what, uh, what is happening in the streets of Nairobi, you know, um, in many ways. As the Uber driver, and uh, I'll let the passenger um, or the clients tell us a bit more. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, I, I worked on the African Union for about 10 years yes. and, um, you know, agendas come before the union in different ways, particularly in terms of the summits. Mm. They either come through um, uh, papers that are present, that are developed by member states um, and tabled for discussion, or they are tabled by the African Union Commission or, or one of the other organs of the African Union. Mm. It could be the parliament, for example. Um, or it could be the, um, uh, I guess, the uh, Permanent Representatives Council. So there's a structure. And it, it goes through a very elaborate process of uh, ministerials, which then usually generate the agenda. It then goes to the um, uh, Permanent Representatives Council, and then there will be the Executive Council, which is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then, of course, the Heads of State Summit will crowd this off. What I found as a, as a, as a kind of, a, I guess, a, an activist and um, a policy analyst is that that process um, many times did not allow for what I would call sensitive issues to be brought to the fore and debated robustly and honestly um, in the public eye. Many of those important conversations um, ended up being in closed doors. Um, they sometimes are resolved before we get into the summit uh, so that there is a general consensus position that is there. And I think um, if we go back to last week's conversation about how uh, did um, President Sisi become the um, AU chairperson for 2019. Um, what we remember from that conversation essentially is the rotational principle um, of representation at that level has nothing really to do with best practices in the country um, that is producing the leadership. Um, and I think that's really what's missing for me is, is you know, is there a, um, uh, an evaluation process that allows for uh, citizens to see where the leadership is emerging in the continent and where uh, that leadership is taking the continent. And uh, with that note, the Uber driver will keep quiet and allow the client <laughs> to, to uh, touch, uh, touch on this. 
I, I'm not sure that uh, Irungu is, uh, you know, the driver. Uh, Irungu has also been very much uh, uh, a passenger in the, in the, in the Upa. But <laughs> there's a lot that can be said about this. First of all, let me address the issue of uh, agenda. The agenda comes in three sources. First of all, there is usually a theme. And the theme is selected through consultation with people mm. to say, what are the issues? Is it climate change? Is it uh, like in the last theme, which was talk about the issues of refugees? Is it about infrastructure? Is it about health and so forth? And so that theme informs mm. very detailed discussions of the summit. And then there is standing items, like peace and security is a standing item. Mm. Because each summit, they, rep they receive a report on what's happening. And then there are also sectoral programs, which normally are noted. In fact, the, the one of the reforms that uh, President Kagame has introduced, and which we started during our time, was to say, don't cloud the agenda with so many items. Mm. Give ministers powers so that ministers of transport can continue to run with their programs and so forth. So those are the three sources of the agenda. But having said that, uh, let me just anecdote here to say, I watched this program and also looked at the Kenya news last week about mm. the summit. I was actually shocked because the only thing that they were able to report is that incident at the door. And not, yeah. and this is where I logo comes from, yeah. that nobody goes to the content. And I ask myself, your colleagues, the journalist, yeah. who go to Addis? I know when I was there, I was always available. Mm -hmm. I gave them press interviews. And I'm sure that that happens. But you could see this guy who came back from there, and it wasn't just the only thing. NTV, mm. it was with KTN and everybody else. There was no content. Yes, the discussions take place behind closed doors. This is a problem I've always had with the African Union as a person, mm. because the African Union is not a union of heads of state and government <laughs> or countries. Mm. It is the, with the people of Africa. Yeah. <laughs> but they have excluded this now. Mm. It is done as if it is a union of states. Mm. This is something that we should continue to debate, because it is not right that the people are kept. If you mm. see what has happened with the Brexit, it's badly misinformation. Right. People don't know. The African Union, and if you look at the program I said from 63 now, has achieved a lot. One of the things that was there as an outcome, just give you an example, is the progress towards the continental free trade area. If you look at Africa today, Kenya exports more to Africa than to Europe. This process in the making. And nobody's telling Kenyans about it. So there is a process here. Mm -hmm. And coming to address all these issues of whether Africa is debating these issues, in fact, I must commend Irungu himself, because when Irungu was working with the African Union from the NGO community, he helped a lot. In fact, I took a lot of work from him, because, for instance, he de developed a template mm -hmm. of decisions made and implementation, mm -hmm. uh, where then you would come and say a country, only you have implemented only 10% of the decisions. Mm -hmm. How committed are you? So we are not taking our leaders to task, mm -hmm. and the citizens are not involved, and I'm sorry to say the media is not helping. The media is not helping, but uh, if at all you have a closed door session, how do you expect also the media to actually channel some content? Yeah? And they fly all the way to Addis, and uh, they are just you know outside. They are locked outside. They cannot get into uh, the meetings. And mm -hmm. another question would be again, mm -hmm. don't you have a media center within African Union who will actually disseminate this information? What is transpiring within the, you know, those sessions so that now we have at least uh, you know, a package or yeah, mm -hmm. a, a package coming from you know, a news package coming from the media center of the African Union itself? Well, there are two ways the media can go because it's investigative mm -hmm. journalism also. One, for instance, I know President Uhur is always amenable to interviews. Why don't you mm -hmm. seek an interview and say, yeah, you used taxpayers' money went to Addis. Mm -hmm. What was the outcome? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that you have sent uh, a note for that and it has rejected. The second one, as you rightly mentioned, there is a media center that has interviews. Mm -hmm. When we were there, I would come out and give them information about the budget. I give them a state of the economy of Africa. But I didn't see any of those reported. Mm -hmm. All there was is that incident of the door, which actually I don't even think it was even 0.00% of what happened in Addis. Mm -hmm. And the Kenyan news, anybody I meet, is talking about the doors and <laughs> somebody who could go in and not go out. Let's hear from Jofa if you have something to say <laughs> on, on that particular uh, session of African Union and mm -hmm. generally the issue of governance. 
which is not a, a part uh, mm. of the agenda mostly, mm. because now you, you talk about critical issues like infrastructure, but I think governance yeah. also is a big issue in Africa. Mm. Mm. Right? Okay. I think uh, one thing I would also want to highlight is, is how the Af the, the, the also as adding to the challenges of maybe how the African Union was constituted. I mean, of course, from the OAU and also now moving to the African Union. If you look at like the European Union, you ascend to become a member of the yes. European Union yeah. based on uh, ticking off some things like governance, human rights, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cons all those kind of values that the European Union as a liberal institution espouses. And so a country works hard to get to be Correct. a member. And once it becomes a member, then it gets the benefits. Most of the time, people just want to benefit from the economic, uh, co economic community or economic union, so jobs for their young people and that kind of thing. And so even countries that could want to be undemocratic are forced to, mm. to, to align their governance issues so that they can benefit from the, the European Union, especially economically. But come to Africa, because of the, our, our context, of course, the OAU was first a decolonizing organization. That was the first core business when it was formed. But when they were transiting from 19, after the 1963 OAU of decolonizing the continent to the AU of 2002, I think they, they moved with everything and all their baggage. Mm. Instead of actually saying, wait a minute, let's put our house in order. Maybe some of us don't deserve to be here. <laughs> Who are really respecting the peoples of Africa mm. and not because as, as, as Ambassador said, this is actually the one institution uh, or that is actually by the peoples. We are the members, not even the heads the of state, state. Mm. compared to even other, uh, whether it's the European Decade. Union or the Inter-American Association. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a closing uh, comments also from uh, Irong Gutiuso. Uh, so, so I uh, think there are probably three, and uh, again, it's, it's a world that I don't follow that closely anymore that much. Uh, Kenya is too... Um, uh, uh, restless, I think, for me to spend too much time with the AU, unfortunately. But there are kind of three major um, uh, challenges I think the African Union faces, uh, from what I can see. The first is really financing the union. And I think Kagame is, um, President Kagame's proposal yes. for a 0 0.2 imports mm -hmm. tax uh, mm -hmm. that would be uh, introduced across the continent, which would allow for something like a billion dollars or something that would go into the um, AU Commission to help with the infrastructure projects and the peacekeeping and, mm -hmm. and the democratic governance work. Uh, that hasn't been completed by the end of his tenure. And it will be interesting to see whether President CCC takes that forward, forward yes. um, uh, in terms of that. The second big challenge, I think, really is around third-termism and um, transition management. And I think if the AU is not vigilant on the quality of electoral processes yes. mm -hmm. and uh, constitutional um, provisions that do not allow for third-termism or coups, coup d'etats, I think we're going to see more uh, chaos. And the last one, I think, really in terms of the African Union, is to think uh, more, um, I guess, more, more courageously around the many countries where there are rebellions or um, uprisings that are happening. I'm thinking particularly in Thank terms you. of Sudan or the restlessness of Burundi, or even in the case of Zimbabwe, the, the, the elusive search for, a, for an inclusive democracy. Right. Let's hear from Moses Tofa, your closing remarks. Yes. Uh I think that uh, if you are to talk about uh, the African Union as a Zimbabwean, uh, actually it's an institution which has disappointed many Zimbabweans uh, in terms of uh, not really pushing for democratic uh, reforms in the country. If you look Setting. at the coup that took place in, uh, in 2017, November 2017, uh, the Zimbabweans expected the African Union to condemn the coup but the African Union did not necessarily condemn the coup. And the challenges that we are having here today in Zimbabwe is because of that particular uh, coup, which was not necessarily cured even through the elections that were held in 2018. Thank you, thank you very much, Njoki. Okay, seconds. Just a quick reminder that about Peter Bierajak, mm -hmm. who is oh, still yeah. in detention mm -hmm. in South Sudan, and so we are still calling for um, release him, at least take him to court and also Stella Nyanzi in Uganda. So as we talk about governance, there are people, activists who've done a lot of work. Thank you. And they're still in detention. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, let's hear finally from I wish I had more time with Moses because, you know, the African Union 
uh, rejected the elections of uh, Zimbabwe, but unfortunately the Sunday countries yeah. uh, accepted it. Mm. There are really delicate balances between the African Union and regional communities. Mm -hmm. The problem of mm. Zimbabwe is SADC, not African Union. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, talking about Thank a coup is always very difficult to say when a coup <coughs> is a coup and when it's a popular price. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Noabi Damba, finally. Mm -hmm. Africans need to understand that our future um, and our survival uh, in terms of the world computation belong in Africa. Uh, we have to make Africa work, uh, first beginning with regional blocks, uh, mm -hmm. and there is no if and when. We have to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate our cordial discussion uh, this morning. And uh, this so still, I think we'll dedicate one time to just discuss the African Union yes. so far. What are the victories? Uh, what are uh, yes. the successes so yeah. far? Yeah. Uh, what should be the way forward as well? Why also speak from both sides of the mouth? Correct. Yeah, you condemn the election in uh, in Congo, mm -hmm. and then we have also Shiseke D as the vice president. Uh, you know, again, you know, in, in the African Union, we wonder why 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 these things. Vice vice chairman, is it the vice chairman? Shiseke D. Yes, yes. One the, yeah, yeah, one of the leaders there. So yeah. these are some of the things that we should also dedicate our time to actually discuss. Okay. Uh, I thank you so much also for your valid company and uh, your reactions on Twitter as well. I'll just read one or two as I'm winding up. Uh, Samuel Orutwa says, making constitutional changes in referendum is good if they are made to make working constitutions. But yeah. the worst uh, is keeping on making changes in our constitutions so frequent before we even test the results of changes simply because changes are for... Uh, personal Absolutely. gains and uh, also we have Jacob Aberem Talala saying Trump's statement on North Korea denuclearization is a big diplomatic tale coiling by his admi administration and Yash also saying free maternal service is not free at all mm -hmm. uh, oh, just commenting on earlier what we were discussing on us as far as healthcare is concerned thank you for your valid company living with us is up next